Hi everybody, this is Brian James from Rhino3D.com and in this video I'd like to show you the updates and improvements to the UV editing workflow in Rhino 8. Here we have a sneaker model comprised of different types of objects. For the upper there's a poly surface, for the laces it's a single surface, and for the tongue and the midsole those are both sub D surfaces. Let's take a look at the upper first. I'll select it and type isolate. I have the surface iso curves disabled because the important thing here is the edges in the poly surface. Each one of the separate surfaces will get a different piece of any two dimensional image in a material that's applied. Let's take a look at what we get by default with a poly surface. I'll select the object and in the properties panel, I'll go to the texture mapping section. I'll click on the last icon here to run the UV editor command. The UV editor will open in a new window and here we see individual islands that correspond to the individual surfaces on the poly surface. And they are all separate selections here and not connected exactly where we'd like. Since I don't have a material applied with a texture, I can use this option here, Use Texture, to display a default UV grid texture. This helps me visualize how a two-dimensional image will wrap around this three-dimensional form. I'll close the UV editor, and let me show you some artwork that is typical for footwear design. You might have one image that looks like this upside down U that needs to be mapped to the outside of the upper structure of the model. The easiest way to bring in an image, add it to a material and assign that material, is to drag and drop that image file onto the object in the Rhino viewport. This will create a new physically based material in the Rhino document and add that texture to the color channel. If you don't see the Materials panel, use the Materials command to show it. It'll also assign that material to the object. If I select it, that swatch will have a little highlight indicating that this is the material the object uses. In order to see it in the viewport, we'll need to go into the Rendered Display Mode, which uses the material. The first thing we'll need to talk about is the transparency or alpha on this image. If you see the name of the image in the color channel, you can click on it to go to that image's settings. And the checkered area here in the preview is the alpha of this image. Certain file formats can hold alpha information. PNG is one of those. If we click on the swatch for the material, we'll go back to the top of it and that allows us to click this icon here to disable the use of the alpha. When you don't use the alpha, you won't see transparency in those areas any longer. It'll go to the color channel of the material. If I click on that color swatch, I can then click on this dropper icon and come over here and pick a blue off of the model. We still need a custom unwrap that more closely matches the shape of our image. So I'll go into the shaded mode and let's create a new unwrap for this model. In the texture mapping section of properties again, I'll click this first icon to run the unwrap command. The command line will ask me what channel I'd like to unwrap to. Essentially, you can have multiple mapping channels as properties on an object and then you can point different textures in the material to use those different channels. In this particular case, we only need one channel, so I'll press Enter to accept channel one. The next step is to select seams. These are any edges in the model that we allow to rip apart in the flattening of those UV islands. You can double click some seams, and anywhere you have continuity from one edge to the next, it'll pick up that whole row. I often like to go into ghosted mode so I can see the edges through the model. I'll typically rotate around and make sure everything looks right before proceeding to the next step. In a case like this, I think I'll add symmetry. A symmetry tip is the defining of a plane so that the UV islands are 
the same size on one side as the other. So I'll click Symmetry Tip, and since I'm in the perspective view, I'll use the vertical option, get an end snap here, and I've got a smart track line to keep it straight, and finish it like that, and then enter to complete the unwrap. Now if I open up the UV editor, these are what the islands look like. I've got one island for the outside, one island for the inside, and this skinny little island is where the Boolean difference was done for the tongue. We have a material applied, so we can change the texture display to use material, but I don't see it in the viewport until I switch to rendered mode. The interior island and that skinny little bit, I'll use the gumball and I'll scale like this to make these smaller, but then I'll hold down the shift key so they keep their aspect ratio. And I'll just drop them into this area here, which we know is the alpha area of the image. And because we turned the use alpha option off, it goes to the color channel. And now we just get that blue color back there. For this island, the one that we really care about, let's scale it as well using shift so it doesn't deform. And we'll get it pretty close to what we need, like that. Now I want it to match up to the edges that we have here in our texture. And in order to do that, you can either draw curves in the UV editor, or you can get curves into the UV editor in the way that I'll show you now. I'll go into shaded mode so you can see the curve most easily. And I'll go over to Photoshop where I made the image artwork that I'm showing you here. In Photoshop, I had a path, and if you have a work path from a selection, you can export that as an AI file, an Illustrator file, and that vector curve, or polyline, can be brought into Rhino in the same manner that we brought in the image. So I'll take my upper AI file, drag it into some empty space in the viewport, and I'll choose Import File. Either option is fine here for the scale of it. And then I'll open up the UV editor again, and I'll take that curve, and using the gumball manipulator object, I'll start dragging it. I'll tap the Alt key until I see that plus symbol, and then I'll release it into the UV editor. Zoom out in the UV editor, which works just like the top viewport in Rhino, and you'll see you've got a really large version of the curve because the UV space is happening in a small one by one area. We'll need to scale down this curve and I'm using shift so that it stays uniform. I'm going to relocate the gumball origin to this corner point and you can do that by just double clicking like that. and picking a point. This lets me drag it over and get right to the corner of my image, and then I'll finish the scale. So something along those lines, and then start scaling, hold down shift to keep it uniform, and I'll finish the scale right about there. Let's see how well I did. Pretty close. There we go. Now this polyline that we brought in, this polyline needs to be, let me make it just a little hair smaller. This polyline needs to be separate for the straight parts right at the end. So I'm going to select it and run the explode command. Then I'm going to use control and click to deselect those straight sections. Now what is still selected is a bunch of separate little pieces. So I'll immediately run the join command. Now I have my separate lines, and we can start to do the magic. So here in the Unwrap section of the UV Editor is Constraints, and this is all new in Rhino 8. The Constrain Edges to Curve option is what we'll use first. I'll zoom in and I'll pick an edge, pick another edge, and then double click an adjacent edge. The command line is asking for mesh edges to pin and so once you're done press enter and the next step is to select the curve that you want to pin them to. The important part here is to 
click on the same side. So I started on the left side here. I'll click the left side of the curve there and all those edges will pin to that line. I'll run this edge constraint to curve option again and I'll do the book ending selection method that I just showed you with a double click to get everything in between after you get both of the ends. Enter and then click on the curve. And we're going to do this two more times and you can just press enter to run the same command again. And we've got one more time here. There we go. This curve in the viewport we no longer need. It was just a way of getting it into the UV editor. So I'll delete it there and then I'll select the upper and go into rendered display mode so we can see what we've got so far. There are a couple little artifacts that we'll have right on the corners here and it's because of the initial vertex pins that existed. You can select that point and delete it and you'll see the mesh relaxes in that area. There's one on either side so let's get the other one which is what we're looking at and that'll fix that issue. And then if I rotate around to the back, the back is looking much better now but I'm going to be picky here and say that I want those stitches to be more even. I don't want them to be so wide at the top. Let's zoom in on the end so we understand what's actually happening here. These polygons in the UV island are taking up less space over the texture than the ones at the other end. So really this line of edges here needs to be straight and right on top of the painted stitch detail. And the way we're going to do this is also with vertex pinning. The ones we just deleted were vertex pins. Now we want to add some vertex pins. And it's this option right here. You just drag a window selection and get all those vertices like this. You can't do any sort of chain selection here easily because of the triangles involved. When you get from one edge to another, it won't know which way to go. Now while I'm here, I might as well do the other side. I still haven't accepted the uh, creation of any of these vertex pins, so I'm making sure not to deselect. I'm just walking my way along here. And you don't have to hold down shift or anything. It's expecting multiple selections. But you do have to zoom in so you don't get other stuff and then after you get those you can press enter and the pins are created and now we'll select those pins here I do have to hold down shift and we'll get the ones on the other side I'm being careful I'm zooming in and being careful here to not select those straight lines at the end that I used the align to curve constraint on because I don't want to move those I just want the pins right now and then with the gumball, you'll notice that we've got this scale handle. I'm going to click and drag the scale handle up and it'll snap right to the origin like that and then release. And you'll see what happens here is that now all those vertices are in a straight line. So the polygons below them in the UV mesh are taking up the same amount of space. And as a result, everything that they're on top of is going to be the same size. All right, so that's the upper. We'll close the UV editor here. And once you have the UVs laid out for an object, you can start to add additional textures that share that same size. So with physically based materials or PBRs, you'll often have a collection of textures. I've made some additional textures here that use this same shape or UV space. So if I come back over to my images, I have one that I call metallic all the white areas here will become metallic on the model. I'll drag and drop that to the metallic channel which is right below the color and now we've got these metallic areas for the logo and these swirly stripes. I'll click detailed settings and I'll add a bump channel to the physically based material as well 
and you can see what my bump texture looks like. Pretty much any grayscale image can be used for all of these features in physically based materials. And I'll drag that into the bump channel. There's a little slider here for how much effect the bump is going to have. And I'll get a view here where you can see it more clearly. This little light bulb icon next to the map allows you to turn it on and off. So you can see if it's making the impact that you want, the effect that you want. I'll add another channel to this material using opacity. Now we've talked about opacity in terms of the image itself having an alpha channel, and we want to use alpha again here, but we don't want it to be entirely see-through to some percentage. So the amount for opacity needs to be one or 100%, but the alpha is going to be controlled by an image. So I want to make these dark blue squares look see-through, so it looks more like a mesh. And I've made this opacity image to do that. And I'll drag that down and leave it in the alpha channel here, like that. And now we have a see-through aspect to the texture as well. I'll use the show command to bring back all the other objects. And let's work on the midsole next. Again, I'll isolate it and I'll look at it in shaded mode. Now this is a sub D surface. For sub Ds, the edge loops will be the possible seams. I'll select the sub D and in properties go into texture mapping. And let's open up the UV editor. The layout is this even square here simply because of how this sub D was modeled. But I'd prefer there to be one long strip for the outside itself. So let's do a custom unwrap. We'll accept that it's going to be for channel one, and I'll double click the edge loops where I want the model to separate. And this should yield two long, thin islands in the UV editor. I'll add a symmetry tip again, vertical, and then open up the UV editor. I'll use the texture option again so that we can visualize what this looks like. I don't care so much about the island for the inside as we won't see it, but this one I'd rather it be a long rectangle with straight edges. To do this, we'll use the edge straightening constraint. If I zoom in, note that the edge border doesn't have small triangles as it did with the poly surface. This is going to allow us to get a quick selection with edge straightening just by double clicking one and then enter. I'll use this constraint again, and again for both of the sides. And I'll add pin constraints to the corners. And then I'll straighten out the sides in the same way, scale and snap with the gumball and I'll move it to the edges of my grid here. I'll also align these to some part of the grid just so I know I have an even layout. Now I don't need these anymore so I'll delete those pins if you find that the pins, deleting of the pins does not smooth out the mesh, add other pins because it's trying to adhere to all the constraints and those corner pins are necessary here. Now the next thing I want to do is paint a custom texture that we can apply for the midsole. Let me toggle to use material so we don't have that grid texture behind it and I'm going to use this option in the UV editor to capture what I see in the editor to the clipboard. Then over in Photoshop, I'll paste that image on a new layer. I'll resize it so that it matches the same aspect ratio as all my other images.
and then I'll turn off the visibility of my other layers and make one more layer above the clipboard image layer where I'll paint. Let's grab a paintbrush and we'll just do some quick swoopy pressure sensitive type stuff here. There we go, something like that. And then I'll hide so I just have the paint. And then I'll export this image as its own PNG. And I have a mid PNG, I'll just overwrite it here. And back in Rhino, we'll take the image that we just created and drag and drop it onto the object. And as before, this drag and drop creates a new material that then has that mid PNG on it. If I go into rendered mode, we have that image applied. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to disable the alpha and then I'm going to use the show command to bring everything back because I want to sample some color data from the upper here. Now with the alpha off for the mid material, it's the same workflow. Grab that little dropper icon and we can pick up something that's going to be the color for the midsole while still having our texture displayed on it. Next, let's look at the tongue. The tongue is also a sub D object, just as the midsole was. And in shaded mode, I can see the topology of it with lots of edge loop options to cleanly unwrap this model. Rather than making another material from an image texture, let's use a material that comes with Rhino. I'll click on the plus symbol in the materials panel and choose import from material library at the top. I'll go to the textile section and let's grab this white fabric. I'll drag and drop it to the model and go into rendered mode so we can see it. It's really, really tight, really small right now. And there's two texture maps. There's one for color and there's one for bump. Now, whenever I'm looking at a texture in a material, I click on that name and I'm now in the settings and the mapping section tells me that this texture is using world coordinate system box mapping. So there's a little edge here that you can see where the box mapping method, the top of the box and the side of the box and the front of the box are all colliding, creating this projection of the texture from six different directions. And when it hits the model, you get this line and you get a little hiccup in the repeat. Box mapping can be great for a lot of applications, but if you have a more organic shape and you want to have a seamless transition of the texture across the geometry, you need to do a custom unwrap. Now this material has multiple textures in it. So I want to show you about these options in the material editor in Rhino 8. There's grid display, there's list display, and then there's tree view. Now tree view is really handy if you have multiple textures because you can drop down the material and shift select both textures so that we can change them, both the color and the bump at the same time from world coordinate system to mapping channel. Now this is using the default of surface mapping on the sub D. So what does that look like? This is mapping channel one. So what does that look like for the sub D? We go into the properties, texture mapping, UV editor, and you can see the UVs that we get by default for this particular sub D. It's a different layout than it was for the midsole. So let's go into shaded here and we'll do a custom unwrap for the tongue. Mapping channel one is okay. I'll double click, double click, make sure I've selected everything. I'll do a symmetry tip vertical and enter and open up the UV editor again. And this is the outside and this is the inside. Let's straighten up the edges for this island. I'll use edge straightening here. And I'm zooming in and notice this where three faces share this vertice right here. That's a corner. 
So I'm going to straighten the edges like this. So that's one. And I'll straighten the next one. I zoom in. I can see that's one of the corners. That's the other corner. Let's do these as well, the bottom and top, like that. And then let's add some pin constraints for the corners, like this. Delete some pin constraints, and then use that gumball technique to straighten everything up, like this. So everything is nice and perfect. I like to use that UV grid texture display option in the editor to tweak the island and get everything lined up. I'm looking at the size of the squares in the grid texture and trying to get those to be all uniformly square. I think I'll need to rotate this UV island so that the numbers are facing up. There we go. All right, and now I'm ready to view what that material looks like in rendered mode. And now we can take the tree view, again selecting multiple image textures in the material at the same time, and we can adjust that repeat value at the same time of both, because one is the bump and one is the color. You can also double click there and enter a value. So tree view, if you've got multiple textures, is really useful. And then I'll go back to grid view. Now in this material, if you click the swatch itself, we have those two channels being used. If I turn off the color channel, there's still a little bit of an effect just happening from the bump, but I'm going to add another channel called ambient occlusion here. And ambient occlusion is like shadows in the cracks. I'll take the bump texture and drag it down to the ambient occlusion channel. I'll hold down the Alt key and then release to create a linked instance of this texture map. The advantage of doing this is that we get that shadow information, but then we have the base color now that we could change to any color that we want. Let's do this a little bit better by using the piping technique, the little pipette technique. Let's do this better by selecting that color from an existing color on the screen like this. Let's get something lighter like that and adjust the, there we go, something like that. Sometimes I like to have some of the color as well. So you can enable the display of the color map and just drop it down to something like 12%, 15%. So you get the best of both worlds. A little bit of that color plus a little bit of the ambient occlusion and we'll make the bump 75%. There we go. And you can drop down the roughness if you wanted to. That's going to make the bump appear more, but you don't uh, necessarily want it on fabric like this unless it's got some sort of coating. The last little bit here that requires texture mapping are the laces. And let's do another library material. So I'll do import from material library, go back into textile, and let's grab this black blue fabric and I'll drag and drop it. Again, this library material is, is using the world coordinate system mapping method. So if I click on the texture, and there's only one texture here, so I can do all this in grid view, the mapping section tells me it's WCS. So I'm going to drop this down and say mapping channel 1. Mapping channel 1 looks to the surface UVs, the flow of the U direction and the V direction on this surface and uses that to map the texture. This means that we can uncheck the lock icon for U and V repeat and just repeat in one direction. So if I repeat it by 10 in that long U direction, maybe 30, 
we can make a really quick representation of the mapping on this complex surface just using its default structure. And we don't have to do a custom unwrap. I'll make a metal material for the eyelet pieces. And let's pick up a color off of this teal. There we go. And for this outsole piece, just to finish off, I'll make a plastic, assign it through the right click menu, and get a color off of this. And that's how you can use the UV editor in Rhino 8. Thanks for watching.